page 16. Uh, let's see, nine mistakes in the use of modals. First is already uh, corrected, so eight more mistakes. OK. I've been so busy. I'm really looking forward to seeing all you guys again. School is tough, but really interesting, and I'm sure I should be studying even more than I have been. Part of the problem is that I'm taking too many classes. You're only supposed to. It's missing a D. You're only supposed to take five a term, but I'm taking six. Anyway, I've gotten to know a lot of new people. I have this one really good friend, a girl named Jane. She invited me to her house last week for a party. Actually, it was my birthday, but I didn't know she knew that. I figured I had better. Which means it would be a good idea or I should do right. I had better. Take some kind of gift, but I couldn't decide what it should be. Finally, I came up with the idea of a bouquet of flowers. As soon as I got to the party, I gave it to Jane, but then the funniest thing happened. I guess. I ought to have expected. She is it's a she, right? Only oh, OK, so we don't know this person is talking about the past. I ought to expect means. In the present, I should expect something to happen in the future. But this person is talking about the past, so we should use the perfect aspect. I ought to have expected. Something was up from the mysterious way Jane was acting, but I didn't. This was a surprise party for me. As soon as I sat down, a lot of people jumped up from places where they'd been hiding and shouted surprise. Happy birthday. I was embarrassed, but I must not have been. I must not have been means I think I was not. But here he, this person says I was embarrassed. So this should be. This is wrong. Let's see, what should it be? The idea is I must not have seemed embarrassed. I wonder if there is a better way to correct this. Oh, OK. Uh, because everyone was really friendly, so they were saying they needn't have been. I need not have been, which means I did not need to be. Let me write this down for you. This one is I need not have been embarrassed, which means I didn't need to be embarrassed. Because everyone was really friendly, so there's no need to be embarrassed. And pretty soon I forgot about my embarrassment. Then they gave me presents. I was about to put them away, but Jane said, aren't you going to open them? I didn't know what to do. In Singapore, you shouldn't open gifts. This sentence is talking about a typical situation, not a specific moment in time. So we don't need the grammar related to time or completion, anything. Just a very simple present tense. You shouldn't open gifts right when you get them. But apparently you are supposed to in Australia, so I opened them. The nicest gift was a new blouse from Jane. She told me I must 
Okay, so Jane is saying this person should try it on immediately. So this should be must go. I must go and try it on immediately. There's a hint. This is actually two verbs. I must go and I must try. So these two verbs should use the same grammar. Uh, and so your main problem is should it be present tense or should it be perfect aspect? Um, and because this has not happened yet, it should be present tense. Ah, I have not yet so you don't have to do it. It's beautiful. Anyway, what a party. I thought I knew all about Australian culture, but the custom of opening up presents in front of the gift giver is a strange one to me. The weather is kind of chilly. How is it back in Singapore? Nice and warm. I. OK, so it says I shall bring you, but it's a question. So this should be. Shall I or should I bring you? Shall I is the more formal. One. But more often we simply say, should I? And there's one more. I have got to. Well, OK, hang on. I got to is fine. It's kind of informal. But this is a personal letter, so it's fine. Uh, last week we mentioned I got to, I have to. I have got to are all fine. OK, questions about this page? Yes. Yes, you can. Uh, if you say I should not have been, that is also correct. Uh, this answer is using the least amount of correction. Good. Other questions? Yes. OK, so. It says I was embarrassed. But blah, 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 everyone was really friendly. So the idea is she didn't or he or she didn't need to be embarrassed, right? There's no reason to be embarrassed. Now the sentence says I must not have been. This means uh, it is very likely that I was not. Um, the opposite of must in, in terms of have to is do not have to. So uh, didn't need to. Or if you only change one word from must to need, uh, this would also make sense. OK, OK, good. Other questions? All right, next page. 17. Eight mistakes. The first is already corrected. We're looking for seven mistakes and ignore the highlighting. I don't think you can see the highlighting on your paper handout. Um, but as you can see on this PDF, there are some words that are highlighted. This means nothing. Some of them are wrong. Some of them are right. It means nothing. Ignore it. OK, let's look for mistakes. Scientists have found the answer to this very simple question. Unfortunately, scientists can't answer this question with any certainty. They simply don't know for sure. There are some clear cases involving itching. If a patient goes to her doctor, this is good. Her. Uh, usually, we, if we don't know the gender of a person, English often uses he. So choosing to use her is a good reminder that not every person is a man. Uh, if a patient goes to a doctor and complains of terrible itching, the doctor will look for some kind of rash. If he finds a rash, 
the doctor will probably say that she must eat something. OK. This is supposed to be probability. Um, and it's saying, why do you have a rash? Because you ate something wrong. So this is in the past. She must have eaten. She must have eaten something she was allergic to, guoming, or that an insect must. This should also be positive, right? An insect must have stung or bitten her. Must have. Scientists can easily explain this kind of case. Most itching, however, does not have an obvious cause. Uh, for those of you who came in late, we are on page 17. Here's what scientists do know. Right under the surface of the skin, there are sensory receptors. These receptors detect pain and let the brain know about it. If there is a lot of stimulation to the body, the sensory receptors might carry. Remember last week we said only the first word will tell you about the time. So if your verb cluster has more than one word, the last word will not have information related to the tense. 时态不会出现在动词最后一个字上面, 而时间不会,状态会,时间不会. So, might carry. A message of pain to the brain. If there isn't much stimulation, the sensors might Report. This should be active. So you don't need the be verb. We don't The sensors might report it as itchiness. There's been a lot of speculation about the function of itching. Some researchers think the function of itching may be. The main verb is missing. The main verb is be. May be to warn the body. Make sure you write two words, may and be. This sentence gives you a modal verb and needs you to add the main verb. So it should be two words. If you write it as one word, that's actually not a verb. It's an adverb. So here it should be two words, may and be. To warn the body that it is about to have a painful experience. Others theorize that early humans Okay, early humans, this is in the past, might have developed, might have developed itching as a way of knowing they needed to take insects out of their hair. Still others believe that itching could be a symptom of serious diseases such as diabetes and Hodgkin's disease. One of the most interesting aspects of itching is that it may be less tolerable than pain. So this is a general statement. There is no question of the time or the tense. So you don't need the perfect aspect have. So it may be two words. 
It may be less tolerable than pain. Research has shown, in fact, that most of us tolerate pain better than itching. Many people are willing to injure their skin just so they can get rid of an itch. Okay, questions about this page? Yes. Here, right? Okay, so in this sentence, you need a modal verb, may, and a main verb. The main verb here is the be verb. Uh, the subject is the function of itching. The verb cluster is may be, and then the rest of the sentence is to warn the body, blah, blah, blah. So you need a main verb. May is not a main verb. May is a modal verb. So you should add the word be. Um, and I was warning you guys not to put these two words together because when you put may and be together into one word, it is no longer a verb. It is an adverb. OK, so in this sentence, if you say might be, it also works. Um, when answering these questions, I'm using the least amount of editing. So if it works with only one new word, that's the answer I will prefer. But if you change it to might be, that also works. Good. Other questions? Yes. OK, so if your subject is itching, then you can say itching may warn the body. But the subject is the function. So this sentence is saying A equals B, and the B verb is the equal sign. So it's like. Um, I'm really bad at examples. Hang on. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, that doesn't work. Yeah. So it's like saying the purpose of a car. Okay, yeah, that's a bad example, right? The purpose of a calculator is to help you do math. But you can't say, but uh, you can say a calculator helps you do math. But you cannot say the purpose of a calculator helps you do math. Do you want me to write that down? Yeah, does it make sense? Okay, good. Other questions? Okay, next page. Five mistakes, okay. Hi, Jack. I'm glad you finally made it to the party. But where's Gina? Do you think she might have forgotten about the party? Or could she had to work late? Okay, this is wrong. The first part is right. Might have forgotten is good. The idea is clear, right? Maybe she had to work late. But this sentence structure is wrong. So uh, this grammar should be the same as this grammar. Might have forgotten, could have had to. So could she have had to? Let me write that down for you. This second have is part of the phrase had to, right? She had no choice. This first have tells you this is perfect aspect, 完成式. 
and it's perfect because it happened in the past or maybe happened in the past, right? Might have forgotten. She forgot in the past, maybe. Could have had to work late in the past. She learned that she had to work late. So this is had to, but this is perfect aspect in the past. I think Gina must be sick. Must be sick. She didn't look good earlier today. That's too bad. What about Al and Lisa? Al told me that he couldn't get here by seven, but he should be able to. Um, as we said before, can, a uh, could is the past tense of can, and can equals be able to. Can is a modal verb, but here you cannot use two modal verbs in a row. If you have should, you cannot use can. Um, after a modal verb, we have a verb in the original form. Right, so like should go, should do, should drive. These are all original forms of the verbs. So this should be, should be able to. Right, so you cannot use can, therefore you have to use be able to. Now, uh, oh, so be able to. Be Uh, told me that he couldn't get here, but he should. OK, the meaning is slightly different. The answer I'm giving you means Al told me two things. One, he can't get here by seven. Two, he should get here by eight. So in this answer, I'm just telling you what Al told me. But if you say he should make it by eight, that means according to this person B, according to their knowledge, Al should be here. It's not something that Al told them. Okay? Okay. The key is whether you repeat the idea of be able to, right? Uh, Al said he could not, which means he was not able to. So if you say he is able to, these words belong to Al. Uh, if you don't say he is able to, if you directly say he should be here, then it does not belong to Al. It belongs to this person who's talking. OK, good. Other questions? Oh, wait, no, we're not done yet. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, OK, he should be able to make it by eight. I don't know about Lisa. I suppose she could be working late or she could work late. Hang on. Be working late is better. She could be working late. At this moment, they are already thinking about whether Lisa will get here. So Lisa is already at work or not at work. The decision moment has already passed. So at this moment, either she is working or is not working. It's not a choice. It's only two possibilities. If you say she could work late, 
that means the moment has not yet arrived. Lisa has not yet decided whether she will work late. But since they're already talking about whether Lisa is on her way or not on her way, she has already decided whether she is working late or is not working late. So it should be could be working late. Uh,通常用進行是代表說事情已經在發生中嘛。所以他們討論這個問題的時間點。要麼Lisa已經在加班,要麼Lisa已經在路上。那個抉擇點已經過了,他們才會在討論。因為如果Lisa還沒有決定
they told, I'm assuming that they told Lisa about this party. So they had the expectation that maybe Lisa would come, which means they know that Lisa usually does not work at this time. That's the way that this situation would make sense. So it makes more sense to ask, is Lisa currently working? Maybe she needs to work overtime. She hasn't finished her job today. That makes more sense. It makes less sense to say that Lisa's friends don't know when she works usually, and so they don't know whether uh, for any event she could come at this time. The grammar is OK in both situations, but different grammar creates different situations, and one situation makes more sense than the other situation. Does that help? OK, it's like saying. Uh, do you have class? Versus will you be in class? OK, so let's say I invite you to have pizza because I'm a good teacher who cares about his students. If I say, hey, we're going to have pizza Wednesday afternoon. If I ask you, do you have class? That means. Every Wednesday afternoon. Do you have to go to class? But if I say, will you be in class? That means on that specific Wednesday afternoon, will you be in a classroom and therefore cannot come? Now, as your grammar teacher, I know that you have class Wednesday afternoon. But I don't know whether you will actually be in the class. Uh, some of you may have other things to do. So similar here, B, as Lisa's friend, should know whether Lisa has to work at that time usually. What B does not know is whether Lisa is actually working on that day. So it makes more sense to use B working late instead of work late. Thank you. All right. Um, if you're still having trouble, please go home and rewatch these 10 minutes of the video. I guess she might. OK, so this it says right now, so I guess she might be on her way here right now. Uh, OK, other questions about this part. Could she work late? Or, or yeah, she could work late. 翻成我们刚刚的例子就是, but if you say she could be working late, 换我们刚刚的例子就是, 这两个不太一样吧？也许你有课，但是你没去啊。所以你有课，但是你那个时段没有在上课。Right? So be working late is she is actually working, but she could work late means usually according to her schedule she should be at work. Right? Uh,简单现在是是常态，所以就是按按道理来说，她应该在上班。大家有听懂吗？好，我看到有人点头，不知道是听懂还是快睡着。OK，continuing， okay, 
Did you see the email? All employees. Hmm. Ah, okay. So you actually. Okay, we're going to talk about this today, but the answer here is all employees are to attend. Or I guess you can also say have to attend. Uh, the goodbye party for our CEO. There's a slight difference and we'll talk about it later today, but have to, you know, right? You must. Are to means you are scheduled to, you are expected to. R2 is the better answer, but have to is also fine. Yes, I did see it. His wife was invited too, but she had to decline. This is in the past, was invited. But the word must does not have a tense. You cannot say must in the past. So you have to expand it into have to. And the past tense of have to is had to. So she had to decline because she's going on a trip. This is, is correct. She was invited. She had to decline in the past, but everyone has to attend this party in the future. The party has not yet happened. And she in the future will be on a trip. Is going can mean the future. Uh, we talked about how there are three ways to present the future in English. You can say will. You can use present progressive, right? Is going to. Or you can use simple present. I plan to. Uh, can also mean the future. So is going on a trip is in the future. Uh, which is the same time as the party. So this is correct. Since in the goodbye party, we must not forget. This is the opposite of the earlier question. This is not saying we don't have to forget. This is saying you are not allowed to forget. We must not forget to buy him a present. We had better get. No two. We had better get him something nice. We ought to buy him something useful too. I agree. Okay, questions about this part? Next page. This page, page 19, is a general review. Uh, some of the mistakes are related to ideas we have talked about earlier this semester. First mistake, it has. It has come to my attention, which means I have noticed. This is the present that some employees are still in the present are bending paper clips nearly every day so this email is about employees wasting their time bending paper clips a few copy clerks even bent the, the past tense of bend is bent. Bend, bent, bent. Even bent an entire box. 
because of my duty as your supervisor, I would remind you. This should be I would like to remind you is more common. I guess I would remind you is also correct, but it's very rare. Usually we say I would like to remind you. That paper clips. Are expensive. Still in the present tense, as it is, paper clips are expensive. In my 10 years of superior wisdom as your boss, I have always given you a fair deal. This sentence is emphasizing a period of time. So in this period of time, I have always given. This is something that I have always done. Do I need proof? Before firing you. No. However, I think. You are. Responsible employees, by the way, think is not a word, right? What is the past tense of think? Thought good. Therefore, I will begin inspecting the desks in this office this morning. By quitting time, I will have checked. There's no need to emphasize continuing action. I will have checked every single one. If your desk contains a bent, this is correct, bent paper clip, you will. Find yourself out of a job. Questions? Yes. OK, so. If your sentence begins with I, I will be checking. This is fine, but it gives you an end time by quitting time, which means by the end of the day. So at that moment. And then the boss is talking about the previous time, so it has to be I will have checked. Good other questions. OK, I think that's the end of the homework, right? Yeah, OK, let's take a short break.
Okay, this week we are talking about three concepts related to verbs. Gerunds, infinitives, and the imperative mood. The first two ones are related, um, and then the imperative is really easy, so I decided just to stuff it in here this week also. So before we talk about gerunds and infinitives, these two are often considered verbal nouns. They are verbs used as nouns. And you can tell from the Chinese name of gerund. A gerund in Chinese is dong ming ci. Dong ci dang ming ci yong. A verb used as a noun. So Let's review the different kinds of nouns we have. The most common type of nouns are words, right? Car, bus, dog, love, idea. These are nouns. The second kind of noun is you can use an entire sentence as a noun. If your sentence has the word that and then a complete sentence, this sentence is being used as a noun. This is called a noun clause, means it's a Jew. And we will talk about this next semester. But the basic idea is this sentence, I is the subject, think is the verb, and this sentence is the object. Same thing. The fact that this sentence, this is the subject, helps is the verb, me is the object, learn is everything else. So these are examples of using a complete sentence preceded by that as a noun. And we'll get to this much later in the school year. Today, I want to talk about these two, an action as a verb. Sleep is, is uh, in this case, an action. But in this sentence, is is the verb, so sleeping is the subject. Sleeping is being used as a noun. The action of sleeping is the noun, is the subject. So we get the basic rule of how to form gerunds. You take a verb and you add ing. This looks exactly the same as the present participle, uh, the one that we see in the progressive. It looks exactly the same, but the grammar idea is different. Without a be verb, a simple verb with ing is being used as a noun, not as an adjective, not as an action, or as an action, but as a noun and not a verb. So sleeping is the subject, the act of sleeping. Is is the verb, and then everything else. Sometimes it's not just the noun, sometimes you need more than one word to completely present the action. In this second sentence, playing basketball is the noun. So originally, play is a verb and basketball is the object of that verb. If you only use the word playing as the noun, we don't know what you're playing. So in order for this sentence to be complete, the gerund is playing basketball. This is the noun. So in this sentence, my favorite exercise is the subject. Is is the main verb. Uh, in this case, the word is functions as an equal sign. So the thing on the left 
is equal to the thing on the right. So this is also a noun playing basketball. Here's another example. Listen is a verb. But we need to know listen to what? So listen to music is what would uh, we would usually see. In this case, this is the subject of the sentence. So we turn listen into a gerund by adding ing, listening to music. The action of listening to music is the subject. The verb is helps and the object is me and then we have the rest of the sentence. One more example. Why don't you try? OK, actually, we can make this simpler. You should try. You is the subject. Should try is the verb. Try what? This is the object. You should try this action. You should try calling them. Uh, calling is the action, but we need to know call who. So you have to add an object to make this complete. So these are gerunds. Take a verb or a verb phrase, add ing, and put it in the sentence to function as a noun. So we have seen uh, when you have one verb, we have seen when you have a verb and the object. What if you need to reduce a whole sentence into a gerund? So, for example, uh, I hate examples. Um, somebody give me a verb. Give it a Watch. Okay. Uh, let's see. She. OK. She watched her friend get married. This is a complete sentence, right? She is the subject. Watched is the verb. Her friend is the object and then get married is the rest of the sentence. What if um, we had to turn this sentence into a gerund? Let's actually give her a name. Is anybody in this class named Ivy? OK, so we can use this name. Ivy watched her friend get married. So let's turn this sentence into the subject of a bigger sentence. In this case, was is the main verb, blah, blah, blah is the rest of the sentence. This is the subject. We have the gerund at the center. We have the rest of this sentence. But we have one more change. A sentence can only have one subject. If the subject is this entire situation, then we can't just put Ivy in there. That would create a second subject. Therefore, we turn it into a possessive because a possessive is an adjective. Uh, so the core of the subject is the word watching, but you need the rest of these words to fill in the idea of the subject. OK, uh, somebody give me another verb. Let's give it a 
Let's not use kill. Okay, no, 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 we can use kill. I found a very politically correct way to do this. Ta-da, perfectly safe sentence. Let's turn this sentence into an object. So the subject of this sentence is Tom's teacher. Sorry, is anyone in this class named Tom? OK, good, we're safe. Tom's teacher is the subject. Praised is the verb. And this whole thing is the object. So we took the main verb and we turned it into a gerund. And then we need the rest of this original sentence in order to make sense. Finally, we take the original subject and we turn it into a possessive. Does that make sense? So now you know how to use a gerund. Now, I should say that in daily life, if your subject is not a pronoun, like his, or sorry, if you're like he, if your subject is not he, she, or they, then it is more common to just repeat the subject. This is technically not correct, but it is common. And because native speakers decide what is correct, therefore it is correct. Uh, but if it's a pronoun, then we still usually change it to a possessive. Native speakers still do this. Okay, questions about gerunds? All right. Another, I said what, four, four kinds of nouns. The fourth kind of noun is an infinitive, and an infinitive is just two plus the original verb. In fact, uh, I say original form, right? In Chinese, we say renxing, but in English, we don't say that. English, you actually just say the infinitive. Renxing dongzi, in English, you just the infinitive. It's called an infinitive. Um, the word infinite means endless. Right, Xin. It's called an infinitive because it is not a concrete action. It is existing in the realm of abstraction, in the realm of possibility. For example, students are expected to go to class means students should go to class. Do they actually go to class? Maybe, maybe not. So the infinitive is not a concrete situation. It is an expectation. It is a possibility. It also is an obligation, right? Someone expects you to do something usually means you should do it. So that's the infinitive. The next sentence is an example of using the infinitive as a noun. To be prepared for any emergency is a good idea. The main verb is. The subject. To be prepared for any emergency. So in fact, this is very much like the gerund, right? You could also say being prepared for any emergency. The grammar is. Uh, perfectly fine whether you say being or you say to be. But to be prepared is better. Because. 
if you use the infinitive, it creates the sense of expectation. It creates the sense that this is something you should do and that maybe you have not done it yet. If you simply say being prepared for any emergency, it's a very neutral action or in this case, a neutral description. But if you say to be prepared, it's kind of lightly pushing you to do this. There is an expectation here. Now, usually you will not see this sentence. Usually you will see. The second sentence. It is a good idea. To be prepared for any emergency. As I'm sure many of you still remember from high school English, the word it has no meaning. What it's doing is in English, we like to start sentences with simple ideas. And then if there are longer, more complex ideas, we like to put them near the end of the sentence. So to be prepared for any emergency is a really long subject. Most people are not prepared for a sentence with a long subject and everything else is short. So it is more natural if we can put this subject near the end. But if you move the subject to the end. People are also not prepared. For the sentence to begin with a verb. So in this case, we add the empty word it to tell people. I know there should be a subject here, but it's really long. It's going to come later. So these two sentences mean exactly the same thing and they have exactly the same words except for the addition of the word it. In this case, it is, we call this a null subject, an empty subject. The real subject is this, the infinitive. Uh, and then one more example. We are to do the homework every, me every week means we should do the homework every week. The grammar is uh, also using this as a noun, right? Subject is we, the verb is are, and the object or the rest of the sentence to do the homework every week. Uh, in this case, the B verb is like an equal sign, so everything on the left should be, in terms of grammar, the same as everything on the right. So this is a noun, this is a noun. Okay, questions about the infinitive? Remember, if you have a choice between a gerund and an infinitive, think about whether it is a neutral description, in which case you should use a gerund, or there is some kind of expectation, obligation, duty, or uncertainty. Maybe it, it will not actually happen. And in this case, you should use the infinitive. OK, so we did this, we did this, two out of three. Third one, imperative. Im the word imperative is related to the word imperial which of course is related to the word empire or like emperor right so this is a sentence with authority this is a sentence that gives you a command in chinese we call this uh zhu. it's a sentence that makes you do something okay give me a verb don't t don't say kill Drink, good. Drink your juice before 
eating dessert. An imperative is an order. Um, I, okay, I should say that imperative is a mood. Okay, so uh, in grammar, we have certain concepts. We've talked about um, tense and aspect. One is time, one is relation between sentences. We've talked about active and passive voice. And now we have moods. Um, the usual sentence is in the indicative mood. It indicates something. It says something. This is a regular sentence. You also have interrogative moods. Interrogative, the word interrogate is like when a police officer grabs a suspect, puts them in a room and asks them questions. Sun Wen. So the interrogative mood is questions. Now we're talking about the imperative mood. Imperative, imperial, empire. These are orders. You want the listener or the reader to do something. And then two weeks later, we're going to talk about the subjunctive mood. Uh, subjunctive mood is uncertainty. Um, so today we're talking about giving orders. In this sentence, the person talking is telling somebody they have to drink their juice before eating dessert. It's an order. You'll notice that we also have a gerund in this sentence. After the word before, you have to add a noun. So here, this is the noun, the action of eating dessert. So how do you create an imperative? Remember, it's an order, right? So you're talking to somebody. But because it is always talking to the person you are ordering, the subject is always you. Therefore, in English, we don't have to say the subject. It's always you. So how do you build an imperative sentence? Use the infinitive without the word to. In other words, use the original form. For example, you probably have seen this sentence in a commercial. Yeah, don't worry, be happy. Sounds fun, right? But these are orders. Somebody is ordering you. Don't worry, be happy. So even a word that is not actually an action, you can still turn this into an order. Uh, I should also say in this sentence, the word worry is a verb. Uh, okay, uh, somebody give me another verb. Come on, give me a verb. Read. Okay. Uh, read. Yeah, okay. So this is something I often say. All right, so if I say read pages 10 to 20 in your handout before the next class, this is an order. I am ordering you to do this. So that's how you create an imperative sentence. Now, because we do not say the subject, 
you also cannot have a passive imperative. The imperative sentence does not have a passive voice. How would that even work, right? How would you passively order someone? It doesn't make sense. So the imperative is always in the active voice. OK, do you have questions about the imperative mood? If not, let's do some practice questions. Page 20. So these are questions related to gerunds and infinitives. Let's do these together. These should not be too hard. Question one. I don't enjoy to watch TV. Yes, question one. What should this be? Good, I don't enjoy watching TV. This is a neutral action. There is no idea of expectation or duty or like anticipation. There's nothing special here. So it should be a simple gerund, watching TV. Number two, I prefer to spend time to play board games and computer games. So it's on. Number two. Good. This should be playing. Again, no special expectation, no duty. Simple description playing. Number three. It's important to keep your mind active. Not here. Whooping ring. Number three. Okay. It's important keep. Um, this unit is about gerunds and infinitives. So this should be either keeping or to keep. Which one do you think it should be? In this case, it's saying if you do this, it is important for you to do this. So th this person expects you to do this. There is an expectation. There is a, a kind of obligation, a kind of duty. So this should be to keep. It's not neutral. So it should be to keep. OK. OK, good. Number four, there is some evidence that older people can avoid to become senile by exercise their brain. Uh, yes, number four. OK, well, the word evidence is uncountable. We will talk about this after the midterm, um, but uncountable means singular. Danshu. So there is is correct. We're looking at the verbs. So here can avoid to become senile. Is this correct? Is there some kind of expectation or 
something you have to do about like become senile? Uh, senile is an older word for um, absent minded. Or is this a more neutral description of an action or process? There's no expectation, right? We don't expect, we don't want um, older people to become senile. So this should be becoming and avoid becoming senile. Avoid is the verb. Becoming senile is the noun, an action used as a noun. There's a second problem in this sentence. By exercise their brain, is this correct? It should be a noun. By is followed by a noun. By homage means it. So this should also be exercising ing. When you need to use a verb as a noun, you turn it into a gerund domingz by adding ing. Okay. Okay. Good. Number five. Playing word games, it is one good way to stimulate your brain, Hoinzen. Is this correct? Okay, it's not correct. How should we fix it? OK, um, what is the subject? OK, what is the verb of this sentence? Good, is is the verb. So before this is the subject, right? But you have two subjects. You have it and you have playing word games. You can only have one. Which one? Good, playing word games. So you don't need the it. Okay, good. Number six, in addition, is beneficial for everyone to exercise regularly? Mingyuan. Good. The subject is to exercise regularly, but because it is quite long, we moved it to the end of the sentence. Therefore, we have to tell the reader. No, no, there is a subject. It's just coming later. So we add the word it. Good. Number seven, doctors advise older people eating fish two or three times a week. Hong. No? Okay. Um, Sun Zhao. Oh, no, no, no. He, he told me he's not going to be here. Sorry. Yes. Number seven. Good. To eat. Doctor giving you advice. So this is something you should do. It is expected. So you should say to eat. Good. Number eight, everyone should try eat well and exercise every day. Sharing chi. Time out. Yes, number eight. Okay, so Try is a verb, eat is a verb. You can only have one main verb. Which one do you think should be the main verb?
it should be try, right? Everyone should try. This makes sense. It says should. So there is a kind of expectation. There's a duty. So this should be to eat well. Should try to eat well. If there's no expectation, then you should turn this into eating because it would be a neutral, but should means you are expected to. So this should be to eat well. Okay. Because Okay, good. Um, it says eat well and exercise. You don't have to repeat the two. It's really try to eat well and try to exercise, but we don't have to repeat um, words if we know the meaning. Number nine, Pedro is interested to learn about other cultures. Why aren't she? Good. Interested in learning. Um, this is a neutral description about his interest. There is a situation where you would say interested to learn, and that is when somebody does not know something and you are making them learn it. So usually this takes the form of you may be interested to learn that class is canceled. In this case, the person you're talking to does not know this fact. So you would use the infinitive because it is not a concrete situation. You are now, you are only now telling them they have not yet learned. It is uncertain. But in this case, Pedro's interest is very certain. This is a description of something that has already happened or that already exists. So it should be the gerund, learning. And if it's not a verb, then we don't use to, we use in. You're interested in something. So Pedro is interested in learning about other cultures. Number 10, he wants live in Japan next year. Here is a number 10. Good, he wants to live. In Japan, this has not yet happened. This is something that he expects to happen. So we say to live. We don't say living. Number 11, he's excited about attend a university there. One eating. Good attending. Um, in this case, the idea of attending a university there makes him excited. According to the grammar, there is no duty or expectation. According to the meaning, of course, this is in the future. He, uh, it is uncertain whether he will actually get to do this. But according to the grammar, it is the idea of attending university there makes him excited. So that's not actually related to whether he certainly goes to a university there. It's the idea itself that makes him excited. So you should use the gerund attending. Now, if you want to emphasize the like in the future, 
he plans to attend and he's excited thinking about when he actually goes there, you would say he's excited to attend. And then this sentence would emphasize in the future he's expecting it's uncertain if he will actually do it. Um, but if you use about, there is no grammatical expectation. Uh, so you would simply say about attending. 12. Right now he is struggling learning Japanese. Lee Kai Chen. Number 12, please. Struggling learning, is this correct? Struggling to learn. So he's trying to learn. It's uncertain. He has not actually done this yet. He is in the process. Uh, it's something he wants to do. It's something he has to do. He just has not done it yet, so it should be to learn. Now, um, there is a situation where you can say struggling learning. It's very unusual. Um, for example, the sentence he's struggling in class. So it's not. Uh, in class describes the situation where he's struggling. In this idea, if you say he's struggling learning Japanese, then in this situation of learning Japanese, he is struggling. But this sentence no longer gives you a sense of expectation. He, it doesn't tell you that he really wants to learn Japanese. It doesn't tell you how hard he's working. It just tells you in this situation, when he is learning Japanese, he's struggling. It's more static, more neutral. 13. He has a hard time to pronounce the words. Tai Wang Jing. Close. He has a hard time pronouncing the words. So in this unit, we're talking about the infinitive to pronounce or the gerund pronouncing. Uh, so if it's not to pronounce, then it's probably just pronouncing. So the idea is when he is pronouncing the words, right? The action of pronouncing the words gives him a hard time. There's no need for a sense of expectation here. 14. He keeps on to study and to practice. Zhuang Yuxuan. Zhuang Yuxuan, Zema. Yes, 14. Good. He keeps on studying and practicing. Uh, no need to show expectation or obligation. 15. At night, he lies in bed to listen to Japanese language teaching programs. Zhang Tongyan. Xiao Si De. Zhuang Li Jing. Zhuang Li Jing. No, Zhang Ziqing. Yes, 15, please. Good. Lies in bed listening to. It's a simple description of what he's doing. Now, you can say lies in bed to listen to, but in that case, it becomes lies in bed in order to listen to. Like the only reason he's lying in bed is to listen to uh, these programs, but that's not what the sentence is saying. So this should be lies in bed listening to. 16. Then he dreams to travel to Japan. Yishun. Uh, 
OK, close. Uh, this part is correct, traveling. But it should be he dreams of traveling to Japan. Like I say, I dream of flowers, right? This is what I, my dream is uh, full of. So here it's he dreams of traveling to Japan. This is the content of his dream. Questions about this page? OK, homework, please do. From page 21 to page 23, before you go, there's one more thing I have to tell you. The difference between these two sentences. You're going to use this in the homework. What's the difference between to me and for me? Both of these in Chinese are 对我来说, right? when I think about it, but it's different in English. To me means when I sit down and think about this objectively in terms of what is a good movie, this movie fits that idea. Therefore, I say it's a good movie. For me means in my experience, according to my feelings, I feel like this is a good movie. To me is rational, objective, according to some kind of logical standard. For me is personal, subjective, according to my feelings. Does that make sense? Okay, you're going to use this in the homework. So 21 to 23, see you next week.